This is Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. This week I'll be moving on to talk about ancient India. If you know about India, India is a civilization that really started in the Indus River Valley, which is now mostly in Pakistan. It's the second oldest of the River Valley civilizations behind Mesopotamia. So uh, I'll get into that this week, of course. Uh, next week I'll also get into ancient China as well. I uh, hope everybody had a great time, by the way. Last week, of course, we had Mardi Gras. Uh, so if everybody, you know, had a great time with that. I know we had a few days off, but uh, of course in the semester we'll be kind of moving on uh, to kind of wrap up the River Valley civilizations. So with, with ancient India, I'll get into a lot of its early geography, uh, how it kind of started. I'll mention about the partition of India, which had a major effect uh, on that region. Uh, you may have heard of Gandhi, who's real well known, that kind of helped develop that. So uh, I'll kind of get into that. I'll talk about the Indus Valley Civilization, which was one of the first civilizations to really get started in India. I will talk a lot about religion. Uh, India is very famous for several religions that started there. Hinduism, of course, the most famous, uh, but you may have heard of like Buddhism uh, and Jainism as well. I'll talk about the caste system as well. Uh, and then also I'll get into some of the later uh, empires that kind of form in India that were well known, uh, such as the Maurya Empire and also the Gupta Empire as well. So these are kind of some of the topics I'll kind of talk about uh, with ancient India. So like I said, I'll be moving on to ancient China uh, after that, which will wrap up the River Valley civilizations uh, after India. And now after that, of course, I'm also going to eventually, you know, get to uh, ancient Greece and Rome as well. Uh, yeah, uh, let me go ahead and I'll, I'll first talk about some back. Of course, that temple back there is kind of famous. Uh, that is a, a temple to Lord Siva. It's located in southern southern uh, uh, India. I think it's called the Brihadasvara Temple. Uh, it was built about 1000 CE, so about 3000 uh, years ago. So Hinduism, I'll get to that later, traditionally is one of the main religions uh, of, of the Republic of India, of course, now. I think 80% of most people in India are Hindus, of course, I'll get to. But, um, but let me talk about the background of India first. I want to discuss uh, kind of get in, in in what the background of India, the history of it, uh, and all that. Um, well, India itself, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, going back to like in the subcontinent of India, as they sometimes call it, lived in India. People lived there a long time ago. You can go back, I want to say, I think it's like 50,000, 50, 60,000 years ago. You already had people living there like going back to, I guess, what would be Paleolithic times. But in India uh, itself, like, I guess during Neolithic times, farming started about close to seven to 8,000 years ago, uh, they think. Uh, and um, it is the second oldest of the River Valley civilization. I think I told you that Mesopotamia, where, where ancient, ancient Iraq is, of course, uh, that was the oldest one. We've also talked about you know, Egypt, which is the fourth oldest. I haven't got to China yet, which I'll try to start on maybe next week uh, also as well, which is, I think, the third oldest uh, overall. Uh, but this one was based in two river valleys, of course, which are the Indus uh, and, and the Gan Ganga or Ganges river valleys. Uh, and um, kind of show you a map, of course, of India on the right. Uh, you can see it's like a kind of a diamond-shaped peninsula. It's mostly where... Uh, ancient India was a long time ago. That would be now uh, what we call uh, Southern Asia or South Asia would be about the location of it. So it's kind of situated between Afghanistan uh, and like Iran to the west and then to the north, China to the south, the Indian Ocean. And then to the east, you've got Burma and Southeast Asia. That's kind of the location of where it is. But you can see Arabian Sea is kind of to the west of it, Bay of Bengal to the east of it with the Indian Ocean, of course, on the bottom. And of course, I'll get to it later. They often call it the subcontinent or Indian subcontinent is kind of kind of what they call it. Um, and uh, I'll 
I'm mostly going to be talking about ancient India, which ancient India kind of goes from like prehistoric times up to like around maybe 500 CE when the Gupta Empire collapsed uh, in the so-called Golden Age of India. So that's mostly the historical periods I'll kind of be talking about uh, in India, which dates back several thousand years uh, in, in history. But ancient India itself uh, is located Really, all these countries would kind of be in it today. Uh, so Afghanistan, yeah, believe it or not, Afghanistan, like part of it uh, was at one point uh, in what would be ancient India, maybe the eastern part of Afghanistan. Sri Lanka, it's that island nation off the coast uh, of India, uh, originally called Ceylon. Uh, Bhutan also is included. Bangladesh, of course, the Republic of India. Of course, main main country there today, uh, which is sometimes called Bharat or Bharata. I think is a kind of a name they call it too. Uh, Nepal uh, and then Pakistan also, of course, which broke away uh, from India. So that, that's the location of mostly where they were. Uh, there, yeah, you can see in that map. There's like three main rivers they have: uh, Indus, which is mostly in Pakistan, uh, which is sometimes called the Sindhu. It's also dubbed that. Uh, as well. And then um, if you want the names, I'll put them on the screen. Uh, but the Sindhu or Indus, that's kind of where you get the word Indian, Hindu, uh, kind of derived from those names uh, over time. So but that, that river is located in Pakistan in northern India. Ganges is also called the Ganga sometimes as well. Uh, is in kind of like northern eastern India, uh, and also Bangladesh. They do have another major river called the Brahmaputra, uh, which is starts up in China, goes down and through like the northeastern part of India, and then empties out uh, close to where uh, the Gang Ganges River is into Bangladesh uh, as well. So those are your major rivers. Although they say uh, the Indus River is more important because that's where a lot of civilizations first started uh, ancient India. A long time ago. Uh, here's also, of course, New Delhi. You know, is the capital of the Republic of India today, uh, which you know India is a highly populated country uh, overall. You see the Indian flag on the bottom, but population-wise, it is one of the largest populated countries in the world. I think it's like 1.3 billion is the amount of people that live there uh, today. You can see more physical geography of India. I'll talk about the mountains that are kind of around it later, uh, but I'll talk about I'll, I'll talk about the Indo-Gangetic Plain later, Deccan Plateau. Uh, those are other parts of India that make up the geography uh, of India, but you can say it's very famous for its peninsula shape, that diamond shape that's to it, of course, uh, that's in South Asia. I kind of give you an idea of the size of India. Uh, like, I know in America, we kind of, our country is kind of one of the most populated in the world, too, top five, I think. But uh, India's uh, square mileage is about 1.2 million square miles uh, in size. Uh, United States is about three times that. Uh, so, kind of give you an idea of the size of India uh, inside the United States, of how big it is. Uh, but you can kind of get a comparison of the two different different you know countries but their population is like you know like three times or three to four times larger than of course our our population uh, that we have in comparison say so, yeah you can hear of course uh, world's most populous state yeah the United States is one of the top five uh, most populous countries in the world but you can see India uh, India right now, is the second most populous behind China, but they do think by 2050 uh, that India is going to surpass China. So India is going to be like, by 2050, it's 1.3 billion now, but they think it's going to be like 1.6 billion uh, by 2050. Then China is actually, uh, they think uh, it's going to decline. Like their birth rate is actually declining in China, you know, about that. Uh, and so, uh, you can see the other countries, too, like Nigeria. Look at Nigeria. They think Nigeria is going to explode on population. Kind of give you an idea. The United States, Indonesia, most of you don't think about that, but Indonesia is a pretty populated country uh, as well. 
So yeah, very popular. There's a lot of people guys going to work, I guess, uh, getting on a train. That <laughs> kind of give you an idea. So some parts of India are like that, like in the cities. Uh, yeah, they have different languages that are spoken. In, in They do speak English. Some people don't English, of course, in India because of the British that were there a long time ago. But the traditional uh, most uh, spoken language is Hindi that you know about, of course, which see 534 million uh, speak Hindi. Uh, after that, Bengali, of course, is another uh, dialect that's also spoken, especially like in the eastern part and around where Bangladesh uh, is uh, also, which a lot of these languages are kind of derived back to Sanskrit, which I'll kind of talk about later. But yeah, here we go. Uh, of course, the, get a little bit about the history of India. Uh, they do think that uh, if you know much about India, it's, it was controlled by the British for a long time, uh, Indian subcontinent, like going back like 300 something years, like going back like the 18th century, uh, the British controlled it at one point. Uh, it was later dubbed the uh, British Raj, uh, they called it. Uh, and so that area where Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, even Burma, you know, at one point uh, was controlled uh, by the British uh, going back uh, many years. Uh, and uh, if you know what happened, they had this thing called the Partition of India that happened in 1947, where British India was broken up uh, into different states. Part of it was because of the decolonization of the British Empire that took place after World War II. Uh, that was one of the main reasons, because the British Empire was declining after the war. Uh, and then also, uh, a lot of the people in India, like Hindus especially, wanted to kick the British out because they had been there too long. And uh, also, it created a lot of conflict between uh, the British uh, and native Indians that were there. And you can see here, here's kind of a partition that took place uh, in 1947, which a lot of it was uh, due especially to the different religions because of, you know, you got majority, 80%, around 80% of India was, you know, mostly Hindu and the rest was Muslim. And so 1947 it led to this uh, breakup of India uh, where uh, it, it formed different states, uh, which you can see there. Pakistan and Bangladesh, you see there, which formed afterwards, uh, were mostly majority Muslim countries uh, that would form afterwards. And then Nepal, India, right there, you see in the middle, uh, would be majority Hindu uh, that would form afterwards. India also controlled that area that's kind of like between China and Bangladesh, you see that part in the northeastern corner. Uh, next to Myanmar, which used to be called Burma. Uh, so they also controlled that uh, as well. But they had that dispute, you know, up in Kashmir, like up in the northern part of India where Pakistan meets. And so that's kind of the conflict they have today, of course, still. Uh, of course, part of why they broke up was because of Mahatma Gandhi. I think everybody's heard about Gandhi, of course. And Gandhi was this famous Indian uh, revolutionary that wanted to throw the British out, uh, he was an anti-colonialist, uh, and uh, Gandhi used a lot of non-violent methods to basically do this uh, throughout India, which worked. Uh, and uh, it influenced other people, too. Uh, if you know about Martin Luther King Jr., like in the United States, he was heavily influenced by Gandhi. You probably know that. Uh, and so he influenced a lot of people to, I guess, revolt against uh, you know, other establishments. So that was Gandhi. Sad thing, he was assassinated right afterwards. Probably would have been the first ruler or prime minister afterwards, most likely, but uh, he was, of course, killed right after they broke up uh, into independent India. Uh, so yeah, going back to the subcontinent, why do they call it the Indian subcontinent? Well, if you know about it, it's kind of like the subdivided part of Asia uh, that's broken up, uh, mostly because of different uh, tectonic plates. Uh, that rub against each other. Uh, and uh, the southern part is the Indian plate. That's like India uh, and part of the Indian Ocean, uh, which is below it. Uh, and then above, they got the so-called uh, Eurasian plate that's kind of hitting it. And so uh, with those two plates running into running into each other, uh, it's creating like the Himalayas, uh, the Tibetan mountain highlands, which are kind of above it uh, as well. And so it's kind of like this physiographical region 
that's separated from the rest of Asia, especially with mountains like above it. And the mountains were kind of important. The mountains kind of, you know, allowed India to become a separate culture uh, compared to the rest of Asia. And uh, if you know about the mountains like the Himalayas, you see here in that image, the Himalayas are some of the tallest mountains in the world, uh, which, you know, Mount Everest, of course, in that region uh, is the tallest mountain in the world. I think it's 29,031 feet, uh, which everybody wants to, you know, go climb it uh, today, uh, Mount Everest. And, of course, a lot of people get killed uh, as well trying to climb it. Uh, so that's, that's located, of course, in the Himalayas. Uh, also, they have another series of mountains you may have heard of called the Hindu Kush, which are not in India. It used to, I guess, be part of what, we, what was ancient India a long time ago. But the Hindu Kush mountains are mountains that are located like more like in Afghanistan and I guess going into Pakistan. Uh, and uh, Hindu Kush were kind of important because uh, they have a lot of passes that go through it that run toward into India. Uh, also kind of like a highway system and trade system that runs that way uh, towards India. Uh, also in India, they have this thing that's called the Indo-Gangetic Plain uh, as well. Uh, what is that? Uh, it's this uh, fertile valley system of like three rivers, uh, which are really uh, the Indus, uh, the Ganga or Ganges River, and then also don't forget the Brahmaputra River is kind of thrown in it. Well, as well, uh, which is about 2,000 miles long from like Pakistan to the western part of it all the way into Bangladesh. So it's about 2,000 mile length of, of region going from west to east there. And um, they think that a lot of the civilization started in the western part, like along the Indus River, and then eventually spread eastward toward the Ganges River. Uh, and a lot of your empires later rule from the Ganges River Basin and not really in the Indus. But the oldest civilization that I'll get to later, Indus Valley Civilization, started along the Indus River first there. Uh, that area is kind of important, too, because uh, a lot of farming, of course, takes place there still today. And also in ancient times, that's where all farming started, of course, in India Believe it or not, there's a lot of people that live there. I think in all those three countries, I forget the number it was, population that lived there. I thought it was like 1.8 billion people live in all three of those countries combined, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, and Bangladesh. But I do know in the Indo-Gangetic Plain or in Indus-Ganges Plain, about a billion people live there uh, throughout that area. So it's a very populated area uh, that's in that region. So a lot of farming started there a long time ago. Of course, still most fertile, really, area farming uh, in India is right there. Uh, they also have what they call the Deccan Plateau. You see right here, uh, the Deccan Plateau is kind of this plateau region of southern India uh, that's within the pen peninsula, like the bottom of the peninsula, uh, that's kind of between the Western and Eastern Ghats, which are these mountain ranges that are kind of on the Western and Eastern sides of the peninsula. Uh, and you can see the average height uh, is about somewhere between 300 to 3,000 feet. So it's kind of this flat plateau area that's kind of high up a little bit. Uh, and um, that area is kind of important, uh, the Deccan Plateau, for several reasons. Uh, one, uh, they think that's where a lot of uh, royal dynasties of India originated from like a long time ago. Uh, the word Deccan supposedly means, uh, I think it's a Sanskritic word meaning the south is what it means. Southern part of India, I guess, I guess what it meant. And it's also rich in a lot of minerals uh, like um, iron ore, coal, copper, limestone, I think diamonds, uh, things like that they find there a lot in abundance, bauxite, make aluminum, uh, and um, a lot of agriculture too, uh, of course, also. But it's kind of a more drier area of India, and it's not as affected by the monsoon, like the wet season, of course, uh, in, in India. 
Uh, that's something else I wanted to talk about, too, uh, which is, you know, very famous about India. India goes through these seasons. They have the monsoon seasons that they have uh, in India uh, where they have two uh, monsoon seasons. They have what they call a wet monsoon season, which sometimes is called the southwest monsoon uh, in India. And they have also what they call a dry monsoon uh, season, which uh, sometimes called the northwest monsoon uh, also as well, which the wet season happens in the summer, uh, which you know, usually happens most parts of Asia, Africa <clears throat> as well. Uh, and uh, if you look at this map here, uh, winds come off the uh, Indian and Arabian Sea, <clears throat> Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea uh, during the summer. Uh, you can see the wet monsoon winds typically come in with rain from about June to September. So in the summertime uh, is when this, of course, occurs. Uh, and then you can see how the winds change uh, in the winter. They have a dry monsoon winds uh, that come from the north, north, I guess, northeast or northwest. I think it's northeast, I guess, what it really should be. But uh, October to May uh, is the kind of reverses and goes the opposite way. Uh, that it does. And uh, the monsoon season is very important. It does affect like their agriculture. Uh, about 80% of the precipitation that falls during the year usually falls during the, the wet season, like in the summer. So I think typically they, they've talked about a no over the last so many years, like with climate change, that India is not getting enough rain. Uh, believe it or not, even though a lot of these monsoons uh, bring in a lot of precipitation like rain, uh, that causes a lot of flooding. Uh, you see a lot of images of that uh, where it kind of tends to, to flood a lot. So here you go, kind of looking at it again, June to September is the peak of it, of when it is. Uh, so it could rain for hours. It could rain for days, uh, you know, during, during basically... Um, uh, these rainy seasons. And so a lot of cities like Mumbai, which is called Bombay or Calcutta, uh, they get most of their rain, of course, uh, during uh, these wet monsoon seasons. Uh, and so, yeah, you could have deals where streets and, you know, cities are flooded uh, because of that uh, happens. So I guess we're used to that, Louisiana, where we get a lot of rain, you know, hurricanes, um, things like that. <clears throat> and, um, they have the same thing like we do. They have like tropical cyclone seasons uh, also uh, that come in uh, during during the year. Uh, although I think their tropical cyclone seasons, uh, the peak tends to be about November to April is when they get a lot of these kind of like hurricanes uh, that we get uh, that hit India. And they usually have a few that will hit that region uh, in around India or in, in the area or hit parts of Asia. I think in Asia and Pacific, they sometimes call them typhoons uh, also as well, but they, they sometimes get these uh, also as well, of course, that also affect uh, their, their climate and their weather. I, I wanna get into next and talk about civilization as well, because they do have like early civilizations that get started in uh, India. Of course, one of the first that comes in uh, that's famous is the Indus Valley Civilization. And uh, this was believed to be the first major civilization of ancient India, which wasn't really discovered, they think, until about the 19th century, uh, just recently, a century or so ago. And it mostly was in Pakistan is where it was, like majority of it, uh, parts of like maybe Eastern Afghanistan, and then also located up in the Northern part uh, of India. And uh, they do think it was a type of Bronze Age civilization uh, that probably peaked about 4,000 years ago. Uh, there's kind of a debate about when it existed, uh, all that. But usually the datings that I get is like 3300 BC. They do have some that go down to like 1300 BC, but they seem to think about 1800 or 18th century BC, uh, they start declining. Uh, as a culture, but predominantly it was a Bronze Age civilization that flourished along the Indus River Valley 
uh, with numerous cities that were built there uh, a long time ago, which uh, you can kind of see in that image uh, right here on the right that most of their cities uh, were mostly made of mud brick. Uh, and uh, it does have different names. Uh, you'll sometimes see it being called Harapan Civilization uh, because it was located, it was found originally in the 19th century uh, under the British Raj uh, near a village called Harapa. And so it got that name being used afterwards. Uh, and so the name kind of stuck. I think 1860s, I think, was when uh, it was found. I think what was going on was the British were building a railroad through that area of Pakistan into India. They found like archaeological sites uh, where they had built these mass cities, but they don't really know a whole lot about it. I think a lot of it's just from archaeology uh, that they discovered like a long time ago. I've got other images showing, of course, the most famous. They have a bunch of these cities that were built, uh, they think, about over 4,000 years ago. Uh, Mohenjo-Daro, uh, the city of Harappa, uh, those two uh, were believed to be the largest that were constructed uh, in the Bronze Age uh, around Pakistan uh, along the Indus River Valley. Uh, so they think the average, some of these larger cities uh, were 30 to 50,000, but they have found like a hundred something or more uh, villages and cities up and down the river that may have existed at one point uh, in that region. And they, I think there's different debates about how large this civilization was, but it may have been close to 5 million at the most. And some people do compare, compare it to the Sumerians uh, who were, you know, in ancient uh, Iraq in Mesopotamia a long time ago. There's even been some speculation they may have traded back and forth uh, with each other uh, as well. Uh, but Mohenjo-Daro, that's the one that's the, the one they always talk about the most because they've done the most um, excavations there uh, overall. But um, I think, I think they, they estimate that one, at least they, they debate about how big it was, maybe 30,000, 30, 40,000 at the largest may have been where it was, but that's that's the Harappa site, of course, you're looking at there. That was the first one they built first before Mohenjo-Daro. Might be a little older uh, than Mohenjo-Daro, but um, that's located like up in the, like the northern part of Pakistan would be where it is. And then the other site, uh, which is um, Mohenjo-Daro, that one's located uh, in what would be uh, the southern part of Pakistan, more down toward the lower part of the Indus River Valley. But that one's more larger uh, in size uh, that was found. I think the one, one Harappa might be 20, 30,000 range, and this one might be more like 40, 50,000 at, at the largest overall, but not as old as the other one of Harappa. Uh, they do think they had multi um, level type buildings that were made of mud brick, which a lot of it was like oven fired mud brick that they used to build a lot of these dwellings that you're looking at. And um, one thing about Mohenjo-Daro, it's famous for the citadel area where they have this so-called great bath of Mohenjo-Daro uh, that was found in the 1920s. Uh, it's probably one of the most famous things about Mohenjo-Daro that's kind of a mystery uh, today. Uh, and um, Supposedly, Mahendra-Daro is a name that meant Mound of the Dead or Hill of the Dead uh, because they have that uh, citadel that's high up, that's on top right there you see above. Check out, I've got an image showing that right here, which that citadel area may have been used to uh, protect the city. Uh, but it had like a, a part of the city where people lived. Uh, they also had like public buildings uh, that were there. Uh, as well. And of course, they also had that famous bath that was there as, that, that became real known uh, today in modern times. And um, there's kind of a lot of debate about like what the bath was originally used for. Uh, it was found in 1926 uh, in some of the archaeological excavations uh, that were done there. And it is considered, like it says there, one of the earliest public 
water tanks or water baths that was kind of constructed throughout the world, which you do see a lot of these, like in Greco-Roman baths that are, of course, built uh, all over the place in the world. And um, they think there was some kind of ritualistic uh, connection to it. They think it may have been related to early religion uh, in, in ancient India because they found some kind of temple. They think that was built across the street from it, uh, which uh, was, I think, called sometimes the, um, I forget they call it the House of Priests or the College of Priests. They sometimes nickname it. And so they think it had some kind of ritualistic purposes that were part of it. Uh, so-called Great Bath of Mohenjo-Daro. Uh, how big is it? Uh, they think it's about 40 feet by 23 feet wide. To kind of give you an idea of the size of it, kind of like a swimming pool, you know, pretty much. And uh, it's only about eight feet deep. It's about how deep they think it is. So that's the so-called um, Great Bath of Mahindra-Daro. And then they got the Citadel, uh, which you're looking at here, which the Citadel is about 39 feet high or close to 40 feet high, or if you want meters, 12, 13 meters uh, in height. And so it overlook that part of the city, but they do think that um, Hanjo Dara was divided into two areas, the Citadel, that area, where I think they, they estimate maybe 5,000 people maybe lived there, which may have been where like a more of the wealthier people lived. And then they had a lower part of the city uh, as well, where the rest of the population lived. So probably was used as part of a fortification uh, maybe a defense of the city uh, like a long time ago. Uh, here's a granary site also as well uh, that they had. Uh, so a lot of these sites like Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro had uh, granary sites where they stored like grain uh, all year round. Uh, but uh, a lot of these cities were pretty advanced. Uh, they had uh, not just a grid system where, you know, roads crisscrossed on things like that, but they talk about like drainage systems, sewage systems uh, existing at one point uh, throughout a lot of these cities. Uh, they had a lot of metal work. Well, they did uh, like copper, bronze, um, probably lead, gold, silver, things like that uh, were being used. They did have language. They had a language system that they, they have that, that's kind of well known today, uh, which is often called Indus script or some people call it Harapan script. And uh, Indus script was a type of uh, writing system of in ancient India that was written on mostly like seals, uh, like you see right here uh, in this image. And uh, a lot of them were put on like ceramic, pottery. Uh, some were even carved into like copper and other things like that, pottery uh, as well. And uh, it's a type of writing system that's undecipherable. Uh, it was first found in the 1870s. They think it's some kind of pre-Indo-Aryan type language system that was used in India, but they're not sure uh, how it's related uh, to later languages. Uh, there's a theory that it might be related to Dravidian, which is a type of language uh, still written and spoken in, uh, in India today. Uh, but they're not sure how it's connected. But they have found several thousand of these artifacts uh, throughout India and Pakistan. Uh, but they're not sure that uh, nobody's been able to figure out like how to read it. So it's kind of like um, it's kind of like the uh, Minoan language. If you know about Minoan, uh, called Linear A, uh, they haven't been able to translate that either uh, as well. Uh, what we do know about their civilization is that it, it existed until about maybe close to about the 18th century. And then after that, it started declining uh, afterwards, which uh, the decline of the Indus Valley civilization uh, is debated. Uh, there's all kinds of theories about what caused it to actually decline. Uh, the main ones they talk about is climate change uh, has been put forth as a big thing, which they think part of it may have been because of droughts. I think there's a theory that maybe the wet monsoon season went away and not getting enough, you know, rain, that forced them to abandon their cities on things like that has been put forth uh, as a popular theory of what caused them to decline. Another theory is they got invaded, which 
Uh, this is kind of a debated theory, which is still controversial today. Some people think they weren't invaded and they just, you have these uh, Indo-Aryan migrations that come in uh, to India and they kind of absorb their culture uh, and all that. Uh, they also talk about the course of the river may have changed. Uh, things like that uh, could have also caused it too. With, that could have been caused by climate change uh, as well. So there's different theories on what happened to their culture. I think the Indus, uh, the Indus decline has been compared sometimes with the Mayans, you know, in like uh, in America uh, about why they declined. Uh, Minoan culture too, because Minoan culture, you know, declined uh, also as well, mysteri mysteriously, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, they abandoned their cities. Uh, it's one of the things, of course, that happened uh, over time. Uh, here's kind of, of course, the theory of what happened. They think what occurred was that they had these so-called Indo-Aryan cultures or peoples that came in uh, to India, which they think waves of them started maybe around the 18th to the 15th century. It's about when they came in uh, from the north, came down through the Hindu Kush mountains uh, into uh, Pakistan, India today. Uh, and so that that's kind of what, what changed it. Uh, to do that. Uh, they think a lot of these peoples uh, originated somewhere around where the Ukraine is. So that's the theory uh, that they have of where they come from. I think the theory is that the Caucasus Mountains, that area is maybe where the Aryan peoples originate from. It's where you get the word Caucasian that they sometimes use to describe people uh, that are the term white. I don't know why they use that term today because they're not really white, but um, but anyway, um, but they can't, they, you can see they migrated to different parts of the world. So if you, some went into Europe, uh, some went like into Turkey, uh, Central Asia, uh, and then down, down into India. And so the term Aryan, uh, that's more of an Indian term. It's a Sanskritic word, uh, that means free born or noble birth, because, uh, I think later when the caste system developed in India, they kind of differentiate themselves uh, from other peoples that are there. Uh, so these were believed to be nomadic peoples uh, that were of upper class, um, you know, social standing, ability, I guess. And so the term Aryan was used, of course, to describe that. Uh, they do break, break them down into different groups. Indo-Aryans, that's what they usually call the you know Aryans that go into India, Indo-Iranians, the ones that go around Iran, Persians, the Medes, uh, the Scythians are kind of thrown into that, I guess, as groups. Uh, Hittites um, would be like groups that were kind of like going to Turkey would be Indo-Europeans, and I guess Greeks, Romans are kind of throw into like the Indo-European uh, type, you know, groups that they have later, but. All that's based on language. Most of the, you know, Indo-European, Indo-Aryan type languages, most of them are written left to right. I think the only one that's not is Persian. It's written right to left uh, because of uh, influence from Arabic uh, later. I think Sanskrit, I'll get to later, is mostly written left to right as an example. Oh, and by the way, uh, uh, Oh, let me get to one more thing about the Aryans. Of course, as you know, in modern times, uh, if you know about the Nazis, like Adolf Hitler, uh, they kind of uh, saw themselves, you know, the Germans as the Aryan race. Uh, that's something that's kind of developed in modern times. I, I guess going back to the 19th, 20th century. Not sure how they connect to, you know, people that are India today, uh, but somehow they're all related, all these different Aryans. But uh, that was some kind of master race theory uh, that uh, some some Nazis believed that they were descended from Aryan peoples. Uh, and some may have been. They came out of, you know, where the Ukraine is now. But, um, yeah, Khyber Pass, uh, you may have heard about that. That's a famous pass uh, that runs down through the Hindu Kush, uh, which is mostly located like around Afghanistan, uh, going into Pakistan. Uh, and uh, it's about a 33 mile long pass, uh, which is very important because of trade. Uh, trade goes uh, between east and west. Uh, from there, going into Pakistan, 
uh, into India, and um, acts as a highway system. It was also used as an invasion route. Uh, so a lot of people used it to invade uh, into India, uh, like the Huns uh, did it, uh, the uh, Alexander the Great, uh, the Mongols, uh, et cetera, all came down through there. And they think the probably a lot of these Indo-Aryans that get in India a long time ago probably came down through, of course, uh, the Khyber Pass uh, that's there now. Here's kind of an image showing you, but you can see it's kind of like a road system <clears throat> that runs down through there, uh, mostly in Afghanistan is where it's located <clears throat> the most. <clears throat> There's Hindu Kush Mountains. That's where it's located, of course, today. It's about 33 miles long, I guess, uh, estimated length. I was trying to think some other things in there that I was talking about, uh, I did want to talk about, which are famous. Yeah, uh, some other things that are very famous, too, I wanted to mention about Sanskrit. Don't forget about that. Uh, Sanskrit, uh, you know, is... Uh, one of the main things that a lot of these Indo-Aryan peoples brought into India, uh, which is a type of uh, Indo-Aryan language, which is, which is one of the oldest in the world, uh, which dates back, I forget how old it is, but it's got to be four or 5,000 years old uh, as an actual language. And it goes back to like the late Bronze Age. Uh, and uh, Sanskrit is a very important language because a lot of the different, um, I guess, sacred texts, you know, of Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, all these religions of, you know, of India a long time ago were all written uh, in that language. And a lot of your languages of India, like Hindi and other Indian dialects, are all descended from it from a long time ago, uh, Sanskrit. So that's something that the Indo-Aryans brought in a uh, long, long time ago uh, into India. Uh, they also brought in these things uh, that are called the Veda, the Veda, uh, which the Veda are these uh, scriptures of, of, of in, in Hinduism, which are um, the basis of the whole religion of Hinduism, which I think I've got an image uh, of, of the um, Veda, uh, if I could find them, I don't think where I put them in here somewhere, uh, the Veda, I'm not sure if I got them or not, that's not it uh, right there, uh, but um I'm not sure where they went to uh, with the picture of the Vedas. But um, if we go back to that slide right there, it had, um, they have like four of them that they have that's that's important. Uh, the Rig Veda, you see there on the bottom, that one's the oldest one. Uh, they think it dates roughly to maybe about 1500 BC, so maybe three to 4,000 years old is how old the Rig Veda is. And um, they also have three other ones that are famous, uh, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and also Atharva Veda uh, as well. Uh, and, uh, but the Rig Veda is the one that's the most famous one. Uh, it has something like 1,028 hymns in it, which a lot of them were chanted, uh, if you know about that. And uh, the belief about the Veda was that they were uh, originally oral in tradition. They were passed down. People would memorize it and pass it down. And they think sometime around 1500 B.C. or afterwards, they began to be written down, uh, which the Rig Veda might be the oldest religious text in the world. It's one of the oldest books in the world. I want to say up there with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, and it's a very sacred text. It's where they get a lot of the theology of Hinduism from, a lot of stuff about their gods uh, and Hinduism uh, also also as well. So the word Veda supposedly means in Sanskrit, it means uh, knowledge. It was knowledge given to them uh, by, by the gods. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Hinduism. I'll kind of go into some background about it to kind of give you an idea of what Hinduism, uh, the religion itself, is about. Uh, if you look at this definition of it right here, it's, a, of course, a dominant religion of India. I told you that 80% of people in India practice it, or these forms of, of Hinduism, which I think is different schools of it uh, in India. Uh, and it's characterized by having a lot of gods that they do have, although if you know about it, a lot of the gods are actually manifestations 
of the god Brahman, which Brahman is like believed to be like a type of supreme being or supreme deity uh, that Hindus think that exist. Uh, and uh, it's also connected to the caste system, which I'll probably talk about next week, about in that part two lecture I'll have later. Also, karma, reincarnation, uh, those are major ideas that are part of Hinduism uh, as well, uh, which do affect other similar religions uh, like Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism uh, as well. It uh, doesn't have a founder. You know, a lot of religions have founders, uh, if you know about that, uh, but this one does not. Uh, it's a type of religion that kind of evolved uh, over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, Hindus do call it sometimes Santa Tana Dharma, uh, which I think there's different translations of it, but supposedly it, it can mean uh, eternal way uh, or uh, eternal truth uh, because of the belief that all living things have souls and uh, the souls uh, are like eternal, uh, living you know forever. And they, of course, they believe in the idea of reincarnation, which is a big part, of course, of a lot of these uh, Indian faiths uh, that develop, of course, in the East. Uh, it is the third uh, oldest, well, I don't know if it's the third oldest, but it's the third largest religion in the world. It's one of the oldest. I don't know if it's the third oldest, but third largest religion in the world, uh, which dates back, they think, over 4,000 years ago. Uh, estimated. Uh, with, uh, we know about it, uh, the chief religions uh, in India today, uh, besides Hindus, which has maybe a little over a million people uh, that practice it, uh, you can see Islam, um, 212 million people practice it. And then Christianity, you can see about 33 uh, million people uh, practice it. So that's your three, top three religions uh, that are practiced in India uh, today. It is pretty old. I mean, if you look at Hinduism, it's up there with like, I think Judaism is the oldest uh, religion probably uh, in, in the world. There might be some other ones that are older than that. Zoroastrianism is pretty old too uh, as well. Might be the third oldest. Uh, but uh, you can see worldwide, 1.3 million people practice it uh, throughout the world uh, with Majority of them, of course, being uh, in uh, India itself. India has the most Hindus uh, worldwide. Uh, India and Nepal, though, are the only two countries uh, worldwide that are a majority Hindu. I think both have about 80% of the population uh, is Hindu, and the rest is uh, other religions uh, that, that they have. Uh, these are other countries that have Hindus in it, too, uh, as well. Bangladesh has about 14 million people that practice Hinduism. Uh, but you can see Bangladesh is mostly a Muslim country. Uh, Indonesia, a uh, pretty populated country, one of the top five populated countries in the world, has 18 million uh, Hindus, but it's, again, majority Muslim. Pakistan's got about four and a half million um, Hindus, but again, majority uh, Muslim. Then Sri Lanka, that little island nation off the coast of India, 2.7 million practice Hinduism, but I think it's mostly Buddhist. I want to say 80% Buddhist uh, in that country that uh, they have. So it's kind of giving you an idea of the different countries that are out there. Uh, and you can see on the bottom, it did give birth to other religions, because you have some, some that kind of broke away from it. Uh, that wanted to try to find better ways, uh, especially in reincarnation. That's one thing, of course, uh, that kind of led to that. Buddhism, the most famous, uh, Jainism, and then Sikhism, of course, also uh, broke away as well. So, yeah, there we go, those different religions. So those kind of like the areas where some of these other religions, of course, are located. So you can see Christianity is more popular uh, in the southern part, uh, also close to where Bangladesh is uh, as well. Uh, Buddhists, you see central western part of India, and also the northern part of India as well. Sikhism is up in the northern part of India, close to Kashmir. Then you see Jainism, small amount, uh, probably one of the smallest, of course, uh, is in more in the western part 
of India close to Pakistan. Now I'll talk about some of these different other religions later uh, next week. Uh, let me also talk about uh, some of the different theological ideas uh, that are based in Hinduism uh, as well. Uh, if you go to this, there's some of the kind of brief ideas that, that's kind of famous in Hinduism that's there. I, I talked about the fact that in Hinduism, they have this idea of a supreme being, uh, which uh, is often called Brahman, uh, is the term they use. Uh, and uh, Hindus sometimes talk about it being the ultimate ground of all being uh, in the universe. Brahman creates and destroys everything, like all living things, uh, you know, throughout throughout the universe. Uh, and uh, trying to confuse it with Brahma, it's actually, Bra it should be Brahman, not Brahma, but Brahma is like a god that's kind of part of Brahman uh, that they have later. But it's not like the West. Uh, in the West, uh, we have this idea of, uh, that God's in heaven, that kind of thing, that God's living in heaven or whatever. Uh, but uh, to Hindus, I think Brahman is more like the whole universe is God, would be kind of what it is. And all the souls and all living things are all part of basically the whole universe, uh, maybe living in harmony with it. Uh, also, another belief uh, is that all living things have souls, which is sometimes called Atman, uh, is a translation from the Sanskrit. Uh, and so this could be not just humans, but animals, even down to maybe insects and worms, that kind of thing might have, you know, living souls uh, that are eternal, that never die. Uh, and so uh, the belief is that uh, you would live your life like a cycle of, you know, life and death. Uh, and then you'd go through what they call reincarnation, where uh, your soul uh, would go through a rebirth uh, where you, your, your body would die and then you'd be reborn into another living thing. Uh, and so the actual cycle, which is like more like an eternal cycle, <clears throat> it could be it's sometimes called samsara, uh, so-called transmigration of souls, uh, where the souls are constantly being reborn uh, into different living things over time, which could be human form, but it could be some other form, like an animal or whatever. Uh, they do believe that over time that the soul will be liberated uh, from this cycle of reincarnation, uh, samsara, uh, which the Hindus call it later moksha. Uh, and um, there's different theories on how to, how to stop reincarnation, uh, which I'll get to later. Karma, dharma, those are sometimes uh, ways that you know, can influence uh, one soul uh, where it ends up uh, over time. Uh, but the belief is that over time, your soul should stop reincarnating and be liberated uh, and become one with Brahman. Uh, the Buddhists later call it nirvana. Uh, Buddhists, you know, uh, try to find some kind of new method uh, that'll um, skip the whole cycle of reincarnation and try to do it within their lifetime. But yeah, these are things that can affect it, like karma and dharma uh, that you've probably heard of before. Karma are like deeds or actions, uh, like either within your life that can affect uh, reincarnation later. I think the word karma means actions or some say right actions, uh, but you can have bad karma, you can have good karma. Uh, and so uh, things you do in this life can affect, you know, your next life. Uh, later, uh, up or down, uh, in the next next life. Uh, dharma is like your your obligations, your duties, your callings. Uh, you know, moral, ethical uh, things that you follow in your life. Uh, those kind of things can also affect uh, reincarnation uh, as well. Uh, in fact, in Buddhism, they talk about the eight dharma, the dharma wheel. You know how that can affect. Of course, if you can end reincarnation uh, or not. But uh, other things can affect it too, like prayer, meditation. Uh, you know, yoga was something that, you know, the Hindus invented uh, as well. Uh, so there's kind of a debate about how uh, to end reincarnation. And so that's what gave birth really to uh, what led to other movements like Buddhism, 
taking off, which Buddhism took off about 2,500 years ago because uh, of Siddhartha Buddha or Siddhartha Gautama, they sometimes call him as well. Uh, he started this movement uh, to kind of, uh, you know, fight, I guess, what Hen traditional Hindus was doing. Uh, and so he came up with his own teachings he thought that would lead to uh, ending reincarnation, uh, which he called it nir nirvana or nibbana uh, as well. Uh, like, again, if you want a definition uh, of the caste system right here, uh, it's called different names. Some people call it the var Varna system, uh, also Jati, Jati system uh, as well. Uh, but it's mostly a Hindu social class strata or, or structure, uh, which they think developed in, in India a long time ago, like in ancient times. I think the theory is uh, that it's, they think it was started by the Indo-Aryans when they came into uh, India uh, over 3,000 years ago. A lot of it is based on your lineage, like what, what I guess, birth group you're born into, uh, Jati, I guess they call it too, uh, as well. And uh, of course, we'll get to like the different castes. There's at least four main castes that are, you know, part of uh, the caste system in India. I kind of could share it right here, uh, you can see. Uh, but yeah, it's got different names. Uh, they call it sometimes Varna, uh, which means uh, in Sanskrit, color, because uh, the theory was a long time ago uh, that it was based on people's like skin color, uh, which they think that may have been influenced by uh, I think there's a theory that the Aryans were lighter skin, uh, and then the people in India, the indigenous peoples, were darker skin. Uh, and so that kind of led to a different class strata being developed because of that, with the lighter skin people being more on top. Uh, although in India, you know about it, there's different colored skin people, you know, from light skin to darker skin, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the term caste, <clears throat> the, the word caste is more of a, um, I think they believe it originated <clears throat> from the Portuguese, like a long time ago, uh, from the word casta, which casta means uh, <clears throat> lineage, is what they think it means, because uh, of who you're related back to. <clears throat> and I think in Spanish, it's kind of like the same thing, uh, also as well. Uh, and then there's a Latin version, castus, uh, which can mean like pure or chaste. Uh, and so it's believed that the ones that are on the highest cast are more pure than the ones on the bottom, that kind of thing. And I think that's something the British noticed when they came into India a long time ago. <clears throat> and then of course I was talking about also uh, Jati uh, as well. Uh, Jati uh, <clears throat> is like your, your clan or tribe you're born into or even religious community, uh, and that can be seen sometimes in your surname, uh, basically your family name uh, can kind of stand out. Uh, and so that's why sometimes like people that are Dalits, sometimes it's certain surnames that are linked to that, uh, that kind of sometimes shows that. I'll give you examples of some of these like surnames I'm talking about, uh, like in India. Uh, of course, the most famous one is Gandhi, you know, uh, which supposedly the name Gandhi was kind of linked to people that sold perfume, like in India a long time ago. Doby, washerman, like he washed like dishes or whatever, I guess they're talking about. Uh, Saravastava, I guess they say that, Saravastava, <clears throat> I guess they'd say that. Uh, military scribe, uh, basically. Uh, so that would be like more of a probably upper class, like Satria, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, But yeah, those are your four castes that you see right there. The highest caste, of course, is the Brahmins, uh, which those are kind of connected to those that are like priests, academics, uh, would be kind of put into that, scribes, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> yeah, I think actually that last one would be in Brahmins, actually. Uh, and um, supposedly the belief is that these originate from the gods, like Brahmins, uh, head or, or mouth. I think this was believed uh, in the Satria, they were talking about the Satrias. Uh, those are, like I said, the rulers, uh, the ones that like the kings that, that kind of run run the state. Uh, warriors, like soldiers in the military, would be kind of classified as that. 
those who come from the gods' arms, basically, his arms. And the Vaishas, kind of like a middle class, uh, would be like artisans, uh, tradesmen, farmers, uh, and merchants. So they were kind of like your kind of like a middle class, really, in a sense. Uh, shudras would be like on the bottom, the gods' feet, like manual labor, servants, and things like that. I guess peasant farmers, uh, that kind of thing, would be in that group. Now, also, uh, you've also got the Dalits, too. Of course, they were talking about that uh, as well. The Dalits, Dalits would be those that are not really in the caste. So they're outside of the caste system. So uh, they're often called outcasts or untouchables uh, in India. Uh, also, they have another name. They're sometimes called uh, Horizons. You may have heard of that term being used, which was supposedly a nickname that uh, Gandhi came up with. Gandhi kind of called them that. Uh, which meant uh, supposedly children of God, uh, but now it's kind of considered like an insult, like an offensive term. Uh, and uh, these are groups that are ostracized uh, from the caste system, which uh, you can see uh, might number uh, over 250 million people uh, in India alone. Uh, it could be also elsewhere, too. These are people that might live uh, where they have Hinduism, you know, throughout the world uh, also. Uh, how do they kind of develop the so-called Dalits or untouchables? Uh, there's different theories that I've read about it. Uh, one is that uh, these were peoples that uh, were like originally indigenous peoples that were in India, and they got kind of put into that group like over time. Uh, another theory I've heard is that these are peoples that are like very poor peoples uh, that do like some of the worst jobs, uh, that kind of thing. And so a lot of it was based off their occupation. Uh, they did uh, like cleaning sewers and just doing unclean things uh, and that kind of thing, like doing stuff with the dead, uh, et cetera. Uh, also, I had another theory too I've read is that um, it also can be people that uh, left the religion, like that, that were Hindu uh, and they became like some other religion, uh, like Muslim or Buddhist or whatever. And so they are ostracized uh, because they, you're not part of our religion anymore. So that's another theory, I guess, of maybe uh, how they came about. Here's kind of an image of it. So you can see, yeah, a lot of them do a lot of unclean things, cleaning out the sewers, uh, dealing stuff with the dead. Uh, I guess if they have to kill someone or somebody, they would use them instead uh, to do it, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, it's something that they're you know still discriminated against. And uh, untouchability and all that and you know stuff like that is actually banned. That's some in I think if you go back to like the Constitution of India, 1950, uh, it's actually been banned. Uh, but uh, that in the caste system is still prevalent, you know, throughout India. There's still, of course, a lot of prejudice, of course, uh, throughout India. I think it's worse in the rural areas of India than say maybe like in the like in the major cities, uh, that kind of thing. But Sometimes it's hard to get a job, like if you're connected to a certain caste, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I want to get into next and talk about more about Hindu religion. Uh, I did want to talk about the different gods uh, that are based in Hindus, which uh, Hindus has a lot of gods, uh, probably, I think, thousands of them they probably have uh, in, in their religion. Uh, but I did want to talk about the major gods uh, that are important the most. Uh, you can see those. Uh, those are kind of considered the ones that are the most famous gods uh, that they have in Hinduism. Uh, that is the so-called Brahmanistic triad or trinity, uh, which uh, it's got different names. They, they also call it um, Trimurti is what it's also called, uh, or the three forms, uh, the three forms of Brahman. And uh, you got Brahma. Uh, of course, uh, Vishnu and Siva, uh, the ones which are not in order there, of course, in that image, but uh, the one on the far left uh, is is the god Siva. Uh, the one the one in the middle uh, is uh, uh, Vishnu, and the one on the right is Brahma. <clears throat> so those are the different images, of course, of the different gods uh, that you're looking at. They're, they're, of course, associated with different attributes, which I'll kind of talk about today uh, uh, overall. Uh, and uh, I'll first go ahead and uh, talk about the fact that a lot of the theology and the gods 
uh, in Hinduism originate from the, the Veda, the Veda, uh, you know, that uh, were brought into India. Uh, so that's where we get a lot of information about, you know, the religion of Hinduism, uh, the theological ideas, and then the different gods, of course, that appear. Uh, but there's other books, too. Uh, like, I don't know if you know about, uh, they have epics like the Ramayana that's, that's famous in India, uh, which is a famous Sanskritic poem, epic poem about the god Rama, you've heard of. Uh, so you have like a lot of Sanskritic epic poems that are well known uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, the different gods, of course, you're, you're looking at uh, right there, uh, Siva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Yeah, they're called Trimurti, uh, which means, like, like in Sanskrit, I told you, the three forms, three forms of Brahman, uh, which uh, Siva destroys everything, uh, Vishnu, uh, of course, uh, maintains everything in the universe, and Brahma creates everything in the universe. Uh, so uh, the three forms of so-called Brahman. Let me first talk about Brahma first. So Brahma, there you see there on the right, uh, with his four heads and four arms, is considered like the supreme god uh, in Hinduism, uh, believed to be the one that created the universe. Uh, and um, supposedly he was the one that gave Hindus uh, like Sanskrit, like the right in the language. And then also the Veda, the Veda uh, scriptures uh, were also given to uh, mankind uh, as well. Uh, and uh, usually you'll see him with like four arms, but the four heads, if you know about that, uh, usually is associated with like the caste system, like each of the different castes uh, that, are, are, that are in Hinduism. Uh, and uh, usually they'll have like, I guess in that image there, he's got the, the, the different, the four, the Vedas that we're talking about, the four Vedas. Uh, of course, he's holding each one of them uh, in his hands. Uh, and a lot of mythology, a lot of these gods will ride around on a certain kind of like a mount. Uh, and uh, I believe the, the mount's name is Hamza. Uh, and it's kind of different variations of it. But Hamza is either a swan or a goose that he'll fly around on. And usually with uh, his consort, uh, which is Saraswati, which I'll, of course, talk about later. But he's one of like three of those main uh, Brahmanistic triad. Of course, that's very famous in Hinduism. Uh, by the way, Brahma's not as popular uh, compared to like Vishnu and Siva. Those are the two most popular denominations where Hindus practice worshiping those gods. A lot of times they worship more than one. Well, if you know about that, uh, but um, it's not as popular compared to ancient times. If you go to India, uh, there are not that many temples that have been built to Brahma uh, that are around compared to say Vishnu or Siva. But I think Vishnu's the most popular God overall. Uh, then there's Vishnu, you see there the image. Uh, Vishnu is seen as the preserver. So Brahma's the creator, Vishnu's the preserver. Uh, he's also sometimes called the maintainer. So he helps maintain and preserve the universe, to keep it like stable. Uh, and um, like it says, he's considered one of the greatest gods uh, in Hinduism. Uh, they usually call it um, Vishnuism, I guess, is the denomination uh, they call it uh, in Hinduism. Uh, and um, got one head, of course, and four arms that you're looking at. But he's a very popular god. Uh, I think I want to say the denominations that practice it is like close to two-thirds or more. that prefer this god uh, over some of the other ones. And... Um, more popular in northern India. I think I think Vishnu is more popular in the north, and I thought Siva is more popular in the south, southern part of India, or something like that. But um, yeah, he flies around on a vehicle too, or mount, uh, which is Garuda. I believe Garuda is like a type of falcon god uh, in Hindu mythology, uh, and he has also a consort too uh, that's famous, which is Lakshmi, Lakshmi, uh, as well. Now, part of why Vishnu uh, is popular uh, is because there's different incarnations. Suppose there's like 24 of them or something like that where Vishnu came down to earth uh, in human form. Uh, and um, they, call him a, they call it an avatar or also called a, uh, I think it's also called a, for some incarnation. And uh, there's different ones you see there. Uh, Krishna, of course, is one that's popular, but 
most uh, famous incarnation of Vishnu is Rama, uh, which supposedly Rama is the, um, I think it's the seventh, seventh um, incarnation of Vishnu. And uh, that's part of why Vishnu is so popular, because there's different variations of him that are, of course, you know, well, well known. <clears throat> Uh, then, of course, we got uh, Siva, or also pronounced Shiva, of course, the destroyer god uh, in Hinduism. Uh, this is the Hindu god associated with, like, death and reincarnation. Uh, so I guess he's involved uh, in the cycle of where your soul ends up uh, after you die. Like, after your, your body dies and you become something else, uh, Shiva's involved in, I guess, reincarnating you uh, and all that. And so he's a very popular god, too. I think that's the second most popular god uh, behind Vishnu, of course, uh, in, in Hinduism. Uh, and um, he also has a vehicle, too. Uh, it's the, the bull god Nandi, uh, you may have seen before. I think it's a white bull. Uh, and uh, Nandi uh, and uh, his wife, well, consorts, different variations, Shakti or Parvati or something like that. Uh, it's usually his main consort. Of course, that's famous. Uh, it says there, supposedly his hair is the flowing Ganga or Ganges River. So uh, that's part of why the Ganges River is considered sacred uh, to some Hindus. And I think he's more popular in the southern part of India because I was talking about that temple uh, that's behind me uh, that's famous, uh, which is a temple to S Siva uh, back there, which is in, I think, close to the tip of India right there. So, yeah, those are like the chief gods, you know, associated with, you know, uh, Hindus, like the three, the three supreme male gods uh, that are most famous. Uh, let me talk about also the uh, different supreme goddesses. Uh, those basically are um, these right here, Saraswati, Lakshmi, Shakti, although Shakti's got variations, Kali or Parvati uh, also uh, as well. Uh, they do have a name for uh, the Hindu supreme goddesses. Uh, they're sometimes called Tridevi, uh, which means the three goddesses, three goddesses of Brahman. And they represent different attributes, which I'll kind of talk about. The, I think the one that's the most popular is Shakti, you know, Shaktiism, which is a denomination in Hinduism. Uh, and um, Saraswati, you see there, is the consort of Lord Brahma. Of course, uh, she, of course, associated things like mostly knowledge, uh, but uh, anything to do with knowledge, wisdom, learning, uh, the arts, science, music, uh, things like that right there. A lot of times you'll see her with different things in her hands. Uh, like it's kind of like it's like a sitar, but it's called a vena, which is like a type of string instrument that you'll see she'll a lot of times see her carrying uh, a rosary. Uh, which I guess is in Hinduism, and then also I think the other thing she's holding in her one of her left hands is the uh, one of the I guess Vedas, uh, yeah, yeah, the Vedas of course right there, uh, also. I also notice like the swastika being used with her and other Hindus uh, also as well. That's something you see. It's quite famous uh, in Hinduism. It's used in Buddhism. It's used in Jainism uh, as well. And uh, the swastika is like a um, kind of a Eurasian Eastern symbol uh, that's been around for thousands of years. Uh, it's actually usually connected with good things like luck, fortune, prosperity, and wealth. Uh, and uh, in a lot of images, uh, it's not usually like the Nazi version, which you see on the left and also the one on the right. It tends to be more square, uh, you see. Uh, either facing left or facing right. A lot of times they'll have dots in it uh, also as well. Although it's kind of theorized about how the Nazi version came about, but I think there was a theory I've heard that Hitler saw it in a, some kind of church, like in Germany, uh, in, it may have gone back to dramatic times. But uh, they say that um, swastikas have been around going back to Greco-Roman times and Viking times, uh, so it's kind of a symbol that was used in Europe as well, and not just in Asia. Uh, the Germans call it the Hockenkreuz, is what they call it, hook cross, uh, which is what they call the swastika. Uh, other gods, of course, you see it. Lakshmi, of course, another famous uh, goddess uh, in Hinduism. 
Uh, she's often associated with things like wealth, prosperity, fortune, luck, uh, and uh, she's often symbolized having four arms uh, as well, which you often see her holding like a lotus plant or uh, sitting on a lotus plant, which I think that's also connected to uh, the Ganges River as well. And uh, also elephants. Uh, you have also uh, the god Ganesh or Ganesha. Uh, it's a very famous male god in Hinduism. That's her brother. Uh, and she, he's often connected with things like fortune, uh, luck, uh, also elephants, which elephants were kind of considered sacred animals uh, in India. Uh, they were also used as pachyderms to move things around and also used in warfare uh, as well, kind of like ancient battle tanks. Uh, and, uh, and I think he also was a patron of the arts. Uh, and, and like Ganesha was connected with things like wisdom, math, science, and stuff like that, of course, as well. So she's also popular, Lakshmi, of course, as a supreme goddess. Uh, then, of course, Shakti, which there's, like I said, versions of her, uh, which she's got all kinds of things she's connected to, cosmic energy, death, destruction, time, and change. Uh, she's, you know, associated with reincarnation uh, like Lord Siva is, uh, you know, basically her husband. Uh, and um, there's variations of her uh, that are popular, like Parvati, I think is very popular, uh, and also the god goddess Kali as well, which are kind of similar uh, to each other. But Shakti is really the most popular supreme goddess in Hinduism. Uh, in fact, they have a denomination, they often call it Shaktiism, uh, that I've talked about. So those are the different, you know, goddesses that are popular. There's, of course, other gods, too, that they have in Hinduism, but I think those are considered the most popular ones overall uh, that I usually talk about the most. So uh, anyway, uh, let me go ahead. I want to move on to uh, to talk about next the rise of Buddhism as well, which, you know, Buddhism is something that becomes popular in India and ends up spreading throughout different parts of Asia. Uh, and you um, can see there, uh, Buddha, uh, if you know about him, he was the figure that really started this uh, new religion throughout the world. Uh, he lived about 500 BC, uh, and uh, Buddha's real name was Siddhartha Gautama. That's what he was actually called. And uh, it's believed that he was an Indian prince of some type who came from that probably uh, Kshatriya um, caste uh, that we talked about. He was either from that or maybe even Nepal, I think is one theory where he may have lived. And uh, his father was a king of a uh, Indian republic. Uh, and if you know the story about Buddha, he decided to live, uh, uh, actually left his lifestyle of, of, of you know, being a uh, royalty. And he became this traveling monk uh, and, and uh, teacher throughout India. Uh, and so he, he basically started Buddhism about maybe 2,500 years ago. At least that's the theory about uh, when when he lived, they think he taught Buddhism throughout maybe where the Indo-Gangetic plain uh, is throughout India. But you can see kind of a definition of it. Uh, it's an Indian religion that broke away uh, from Hinduism, uh, which was based on the teachings of Buddha. Uh, and uh, it does talk about like what the Buddhist like main aim was or main goal uh, that they were trying to do. Uh, the Buddhists were one of the first to try to challenge uh, the traditional teachings of Hinduism. Uh, they believed that there had to be some kind of way that you could liberate your soul from the cycle of reincarnation or samsara and do it within one lifetime. And so supposedly that was something that Buddha figured out uh, during his life. So, yeah, Buddha was supposedly in his 30s uh, when uh, he decided to basically leave uh, his lifestyle uh, as a prince uh, and become this like monk. Uh, and uh, he tried different methods to reach uh, what he called enlightenment. Uh, I know one where it was he tried to, like, I think there's an image right there where he's sitting under a tree. You see that image right there? He sat under a tree and tried to like starve himself to death, like eating like, extreme asceticism, I think they call it. And so that method didn't work. Uh, and what he figured out, 
the best way to live your life uh, was to live what he called a middle path or middle way, uh, which is kind of this path between two extremes, uh, where you're not like practicing like extreme uh, asceticism or uh, extreme uh, sensual indulgence would be the other way uh, as well, but to live your life uh, basically this mean or middle way of living, uh, which we ba based on like certain dharmas uh, that he would create. I think he called the eight dharmas, so-called dharma wheel, of course, that represents it in, in um, Buddhism. Uh, he would eventually teach what they call the Four Noble Truths, uh, which uh, later, of course, Buddha uh, is called the Enlightened One. Uh, they called him this because, by the way, I think he was like, I want to say 35, or was in his 30s, I know, when he reached enlightenment. Uh, so they called him the Enlightened One, the Buddha. Uh, and um, his main teachings were eventually called the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and uh, the Four Noble Truths, uh, were these four main ideas about like what was basically what it is it's what was you know causing reincarnation and how to end it that's pretty much in a nutshell of what the four noble truths uh, were really about now I'll kind of I'll kind of go through and discuss like the different uh, four noble truths and what they are but they're, they're very important they're like the central teachings of Buddhism and what Buddha taught you know, I guess 2,500 years ago, they basically tell you like what causes reincarnation and how to end it, how to end, I guess, samsara or the cycle of reincarnation, et cetera. Uh, of course, you see there, I've got the Sanskritic names, they call it. Uh, the first one is uh, dukkha. That's the first noble truth, uh, which means in Sanskrit, suffering. And so what Buddha believed was that Everybody was uh, basically their souls were suffering because they're constantly being reincarnated like over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so that's going on. So samsara is basically uh, what's called what's what's that with the suffering. Uh, the second noble truth is called samudaya, uh, which uh, there's different translations of that, but I guess it can mean like the cause, the cause of the suffering. And uh, what Buddha said was that the cause of the suffering is because humans throughout their life, maybe even, I guess, animals or whatever, are constantly trying to get material things, like physical things, uh, power, money, food, or whatever. Their whole life is about that, basically. Uh, and so uh, he says that's the reason why everybody's reincarnating because they're constantly trying to get all these things that they, I guess, need to live or whatever. And their whole life is about it, obsessing over it and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's the so-called second noble truth. The third noble truth is Naroda, uh, which there's different translations of what it may mean. A cessation, I think, is one variation, uh, or maybe the word is ending uh, in Sanskrit as well. That's where you renounce all the attachment to all these material things, desires, and so on. Your whole life isn't about that, obsessing over that, uh, in that kind of thing. Uh, and the last one is Maga, or sometimes Marga, also as well, uh, the so-called fourth noble truth, last one. Uh, and uh, in Sanskrit, uh, Maga or Marga means path, is what it means, translation. And they sometimes call that the so-called middle path, middle way, central path or central way. It's got all kinds of different names uh, that they call it. Uh, and um, that one includes various dharma that you have to follow, which I do have it right here for you. But there's basically call also the noble eightfold path is the other name they call it. It's got all kinds of names. Uh, they dub it. But you have to have all these right things that you have to do, uh, which right view. Uh, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Uh, and it's usually symbolized, if you know about this, in the so-called Dharma wheel or Dharma chakra, if you want the uh, Sanskrit uh, wheel of Dharma. Uh, and uh, those are all the eight that you have to follow, the eight Dharma to live your life, you know, this middle path, 
uh, that Buddha is talking about. So right view, uh, you have to know the truth. Uh, right intentions, you have to free your mind of evil things. You can't think about evil things or bad things or even doing bad things. Right speech, say nothing that hurts other people. Uh, right actions, work for the good of others. Uh, right livelihood, respect of life. Uh, no killing things. Buddhists are nonviolent. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, they're pacifists. Uh, right effort, resist evil. Uh, right concentration, practice meditation, prayer, things like that. Right mindfulness, controlling your thoughts, uh, things like that. Uh, so all, all those are different, you know, dharma that you have to follow throughout your life uh, if you want to reach enlightenment and, of course, in, in reincarnation uh, in the end. So, uh, and about Buddhism, by the way, it did spread. Uh, if you look here, uh, of course, it, they, they think it spread, uh, or at least it started, they think, in that northern part of India and maybe Nepal. And then you can see it went up into Tibet and China, uh, Mongolia, uh, into China itself, uh, Southeast Asia, from like Burma, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, all those are areas that uh, Buddhism uh, basically spread to. And you end up with like three different types of Buddhism. They have Vajra, Vajra, Vajrayana Buddhism, of course, uh, which is one that you see, it's mostly the one that Tibetan Buddhism that's well known, associated with like the Dalai Lama, of course. Uh, Mahayana Buddhism, and then Theravada Buddhism is also popular like in Southeast Asia as well. But Mahayana Buddhism is more popular, you see, East Asia, like in China, Korea, uh, and of course, uh, Japan. Uh, if you know about Buddhism, uh, it's the fourth largest religion in the world. So it's kind of like behind Christianity, uh, Islam, uh, and Hinduism. I think the number of people that practice is like over 500 million people uh, throughout the world, with China having the most, uh, Hindu, uh, the most Buddhists uh, overall which I think it's something like 250 million maybe range uh, is, is what it is. Uh, however, if you know about China, it's, they're mostly atheists uh, because of communism. Uh, but they have other things like they've got also not just Buddhism, but they've got uh, Confucianism, probably uh, Taoism, uh, and then maybe some Christians here and there uh, as well. Uh, here's another map showing you on the left kind of where it starts. So you can see the central part of it was in that north, northern or eastern part of India uh, and also Tibet, not Tibet, Nepal. Yeah, northern India and Nepal mostly. Then you can see it went south. You can see down to where Sri Lanka is. Sri Lanka is mostly uh, Buddhist. Uh, it also went up into Afghanistan, uh, which they think the Greeks helped spread Buddhism kind of to the west. Uh, also, uh, you can see going up in Tibet, Mongolia, China, and working its way down uh, into uh, Southeast Asia. But don't forget, it's also down into like, like around Sumatra and Indonesia, uh, Philippines, uh, and so on, all those areas, Borneo. And then, of course, you can see Japan, Taiwan, et cetera, Korea also. So those are all the areas, I guess, where it's most dominant. Uh, Buddhism, but I uh, also see Buddhism in the Pacific. Like you go to Hawaii, in the United States, Hawaii, uh, you'll have a lot of Buddhist temples uh, that are also there. Uh, I've been to Hawaii a few times. Now, also, I, oh, uh, I, I also wanted to talk about Jainism uh, as well, kind of get into that, because that's kind of another offshoot religion that kind of broke away. Uh, from from um, Hinduism as well, uh, which uh, it's got different names. They usually call it uh, Jan Dharma is what they call it. Uh, and it's a type of Indian religion that uh, started around the same time as Buddhism. So about 6th or 5th century, I think, is when they think it started uh, in India a long time ago. And it was found about that man on the right you see in that image named Mahavara, who's also known as Vardhaman. Uh, as well. And um, I think he was some kind of uh, Hindu uh, prince like um, 
probably like um, Indian prince like uh, Buddha was a long time ago. He, he did the same thing. He challenged Hinduism as well. Uh, he had his own ideas about how they could, you know, end uh, reincarnation, but his was different compared to uh, Buddhism. Like, how does it, how does it differ uh, from Buddhism? Well, uh, if you know about them, uh, they tended to prefer to use more extreme asceticism, like in living their lifestyle. Uh, instead of that middle path of living, uh, we were talking about uh, where it's between, you know, two extremes. Uh, they went more to extreme asceticism, uh, like, you know, extreme fasting and stuff like that would be an example of that. Or you would get rid of all your material things. Like you wouldn't own a whole lot of uh, wealth. Uh, you wouldn't wear a lot of clothes. You'd kind of live the lifestyle of a monk, even if you're like a lay person. Uh, and so the word Jan supposedly meant in Sanskrit to conquer, to conquer your desires, you know, material things. Uh, and so that's primarily what what they tried to do with this particular movement. But it's not as popular, you know, compared to say Hinduism or even Buddhism. Uh, you can see around five million people or more practice it uh, throughout the world. Uh, predominantly, it's mostly practiced in India. Uh, I think the western part of India is mostly where it's more popular. Uh, but it has spread throughout the world. I mean, you have people that are Jans uh, that are in like Canada, uh, the United States, uh, Europe. And they think in the last so many years, uh, they've had Jans that have spread also into Japan also. Uh, so it's not a movement that's real popular, like I said, uh, compared to Buddhists uh, or Hindus. Uh, so it's kind of this minority uh, religion. So um, that's, that's enough about religion, of course, uh, with ancient India and, of course, India today uh, in parts of the world. Uh, I want to talk about next for a few minutes about different. Uh, oh, and here I'll kind of show you this real quick here before I move on. I've got another slide showing you the, some of the beliefs uh, that they're big into. Ahimsa is a belief that uh, is big in also Buddhism, uh, which is this idea of being nonviolent. So uh, that basically no physical violence on uh, things like that. Uh, so they, they, you know, they all want to, you know, not harm, uh, you know, living things and stuff like that. And so a lot of Jans tend to be like vegetarians. Uh, but in a lot of cases, they even would sit there and do extreme fasting or starve themselves to death. And I think in India, they talked about some of these Jan kings that did that, where they starved themselves to death, you know, as an example. Karma, yeah, because I believe that for every action, there is a consequence. They say, like, they believe this in pretty much Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, reincarnation, yeah, they believe in that too, but they're trying to kind of stop it uh, with with their uh, idea of extreme asceticism. They think that might be a key uh, to ending it uh, compared to Buddha's, uh, you know, middle path. So those are some other things they do, nonviolence, truthfulness, non-stealing, celibacy. It's another thing that's part of too, of Jainism non-possession, not owning a whole lot of things as well. Now, I want to talk about, uh, of course, the rise of Indian empires, which are, you know, become famous uh, in India a long time ago. Of course, there's one, one famous uh, empire that's well known uh, is the Maurya Empire, which developed more than, I think, more than 2,000 years ago is when it existed in, in ancient India. Uh, that, that image there you can see in the middle is the the king Ashoka, Ashoka the Great, uh, considered, by the way, one of the greatest kings uh, in ancient India. Uh, that's his symbol on the left uh, with, the, with the three lions uh, on it. And it's got that Ashoka wheel uh, that's famous, which I think is often seen in the Indian flag uh, today. Uh, and... Uh, they call it different names, of course, Maria Empire. You'll see also Marian, Marian as well, which is the name of the dynasty uh, that, of course, will rule, rule India overall. And uh, the Marian Empire uh, was this uh, pan-Indian uh, empire that 
was one of the first to take the whole subcontinent and unify it as one empire. So they were the first to do this uh, in ancient times. And you can see the empire lasted from about 322 uh, to, 100, to 185 BC. Uh, so it lasted roughly 100 something years, well, probably one and a half centuries, I think is about how long uh, it, was a, it was around. Uh, and um, there, of course, is kind of a map of the actual empire uh, when it peaked in the third century BC. So you can see this empire controlled land from what they think was Afghanistan into Pakistan and controlled most of India, except for the bottom of it in Sri Lanka. And then I think part of Bangladesh uh, was also part of it uh, as well. So it was a massive empire. Uh, and um, of course, that was one of the first rulers that really came to power, which is Chandragupta Maurya. He was considered really uh, the founder of the dynasty and the first emperor uh, that ruled uh, over over India at the time. Uh, and I don't know if you know much about the Indian monarchs. Uh, a lot of times they're called a Maharaja, uh, which uh, there's different translations of that uh, in Sanskrit, but it often means either it says great king or high king, uh, which is kind of like equivalent to like, almost like an emperor would be, I guess what it would be uh, maybe to the West. They have a Persian version, which is also, you can see Shah and Shah, like the Persian empires used uh, Shahs, uh, which are the king of kings. And if you know about it, it's kind of like an inflated title. It's like, I'm not a king, I'm a great king. Uh, it's basically what it is. Although you can say I'm a great king of kings. <laughs> it's kind of getting more inflated. They did this in Iraq too. Like a lot of the Syrian kings, like Ashurbanipal, would say that I'm the king of kings and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, they do think that this actual uh, state uh, developed in an area called Magadha, which is kind of like in the eastern part of India. And they conquered the state called the Nanda Empire that was there in northern India. They, they took over that. They formed an empire out of it. And then what happened was they think that Alexander the Great's empire, uh, which had conquered part of India, it collapsed. And they took part of that too, like Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, which uh, he actually took over uh, Alexander the Great uh, in the fourth century. So they think Alexander did this right before Chandragupta Maurya came in. Uh, and so I'm guessing that uh, Alexander, what he did in the West was kind of an influence uh, you know, on these Indian empires that would be founded later. Now, I think vice versa, they were kind of influenced by him too, also as well. Uh, there's Chandragupta right there. You can see he reigned from 328 to 298 BC. So he was around for about 30 something years as a ruler. Uh, they do think he uh, developed a huge standing army. And he was able to use that to conquer most of Northern India, pushing into at one point, close to Pakistan and Afghanistan. So all that area under him uh, was, was consolidated into one massive state uh, at that time. Uh, he had a capital, which you see right there, Pathalaputra, you may have heard of it. Uh, it was, of course, a famous city, uh, which is located on the Ganges or Ganga River. Uh, it's, if you know about the, a lot of empires in, in India, a lot of them are based around the Ganges River in northern eastern India. Uh, and uh, it's located near uh, the modern city of Patna, which is kind of, uh, kind of just west of Bangladesh. Uh, and so that became the central capital of that empire and other empires that followed. I think the Gupta Empire, that was pretty much its capital uh, that they would have. And they think it dates back to about 500 BC. That's, that's when the actual city uh, was founded. Here's kind of some images of it with these, some of the ruins uh, that you're looking at right there. So about 500 BC uh, is when they think the city was founded. Uh, there's kind of debate about how big it was, but they think under the Mauryan Empire, it may have gotten to about 400,000 people uh, in size. So they do think it may have been one of the largest cities uh, in the world, kind of like Babylon was. Uh, we had talked about before Nineveh has large cities, and it was huge in size. I think what I researched, it was about 15 square miles uh, in size, the actual city, or if you want kilometers, 
uh, 25 square kilometers. Uh, and uh, Greek, the Greeks actually wrote about it. The Greek historian, Arian, uh, said that it had something like 64 gates uh, to the city with 570 towers. So it must have had huge fortifications that were around it uh, at Palo Putra. But now, of course, you can see it's mostly uh, in ruins today. Uh, here's kind of a stupa, uh, which is located, I think, at the same site uh, where the ruins of, of Padalaputra, which a stupa is like a, a kind of like a shrine uh, where they keep like the bones of Buddhist monks in it. Uh, and you can go in there and meditate, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and so that was kind of constructed there. I think Ashoka the Great built that later though, at that site. Uh, now, they have another king that came in after uh, Chandragupta Maurya died. Uh, that was, of course, uh, Bindusara, uh, who was believed to be uh, his son. Uh, he reigned, uh, you can see, from about 297 to 273 B.C. Uh, they think under Bindusara uh, that they pretty much began to consolidate uh, Chandragupta's empire. And Bindusara also began expanding the empire to the south like into the southern part of the subcontinent of India, but not too much is known about him. Uh, there's a lack of historical sources about Ben Dusara, because uh, most, I think most sources talk about either Chandragupta, Maria, or Ashoka the Great, who's, of course, the most famous overall. That's the one I really want to talk about the most, uh, of course, which is Ashoka the Great. You see the third, third ruler, of course, and the greatest, of course, of the Mauryan uh, Empire. Uh, he ruled, of course, uh, following his father dying, Ben Dusara. Uh, he reigned from 268 to about 232 BC. Uh, and uh, they think under him, he kept expanding the empire, which they think he kind of expanded to the east and south uh, to where the Bay of Bengal is uh, at one point. And um, one thing he did, it's very famous, he conquered this area called Kalinga, uh, just kind of a famous kingdom and people of India uh, that are kind of around where the Bay of Bengal is, uh, to a little bit to the west and south of uh, where Bangladesh is now. And uh, he was involved in a series of bloody wars uh, that they call the Kalinga Wars, uh, which were fought uh, throughout his empire. Uh, and um, some estimates he may have killed in that war like 200,000 people or more uh, in the conquest of that area. It was kind of considered like one of the last conquests of the whole uh, Mauryan Empire. Uh, so, uh, so that's something that he's kind of famous for uh, with that. And so under his reign, you know, by that time, you know, the empire starts to get bigger and bigger. Now, you can see here in this map here, I think after that conquest, that's kind of what his empire looked at like afterwards. Now, the only thing was apparently, I think that what I've read about, about Ashaka was that that war influenced him uh, religious wise. Uh, and one thing that happened that's well known, uh, he converted to Buddhism. That's something that's very famous. Uh, and so he's considered like one of the first major Buddhist uh, rulers of India. Uh, he not only made it popular in India, parts of India, uh, but he also helped to spread it. So he sent like Buddhist monks, missionaries uh, into different parts of Asia, uh, mostly probably northward, like I guess towards Afghanistan and then uh, like into Tibet and Central Asia uh, as well. And uh, that included not just that, but he also constructed like different types of Buddhist temples uh, throughout India. Uh, told you he built shrines, uh, he built stupas uh, throughout India. Uh, and so uh, Shaka, Shaka was well known for being a patron uh, in support of those that were, of course, uh, Buddhist. I think I've got some other images right here. He's also known for uh, these things called the edicts of Ashaka, uh, which uh, were uh, put on pillars, called also the so-called Shaka pillars. But you see one of them right there, uh, that picture, uh, Shaka pillar, and I guess the one on the right uh, as well. Some of the pillars will have like, I think like three, I guess it's like three lions on it, uh, basically. And uh, they found at least 33 inscriptions or edicts that were published like during his reign. Uh, and 
a lot of the edicts uh, reference Buddhism because you know, he had such big support for it. And, and so that was something that was a big thing he wanted to do uh, as a ruler of India. But a lot of his ideas uh, talk about laws, which uh, are uh, universal law. You know, the idea of everybody having the same kind of equal law uh, in, in, in India, uh, the idea of social order, uh, the idea of piety, uh, and also the order of also the belief in righteousness. Those are ideas that he kind of pushed uh, in a lot of a lot of his laws overall. But I think that's kind of you're looking at some of the ruins there of the capital, Pat, Pataliputra, of course, near uh, Patna uh, in India. So yeah, he's really considered their greatest ruler. Uh, you know, today uh, in the Indian flag, uh, they have the famous Ashaka wheel, uh, which is now in it, which is really a Buddha symbol, but uh, it's basically there uh, from from that time period a long time ago. All right, I want to talk about also for a few minutes the Gupta Empire. That was another famous empire uh, that developed in India, which was much later. Uh, in fact, it was more into like the end of uh, late late antiquity or late ancient times uh, in India. Uh, what happened was uh, there were a few more rulers that reigned after Ashoka died. I think I want to say six more that reigned later. Uh, but the empire broke up. And India broke up into like multiple competing kingdoms. Uh, and it wouldn't be until the Gupta Empire came about uh, that they reunited it uh, as, as one empire. Uh, kind of what was the Gupta Empire? It was this India state, Indian state that was uh, located around where Magadha is. Uh, we're talking about India, but it was based again uh, in the Ganges River Valley. And you can see that was the time period of fourth to the sixth century CE. Uh, so like 300s to about the 500s uh, AD or CE uh, that you're looking at. It's a very famous period. Uh, kind of should kind of blow it up right here. You can see Pataliputra was one of its major cities, of course, capitals uh, that was part of this uh, empire. Uh, they do call that period the Golden Age of India. They dub it that because that was considered the peak period of where Indian culture in ancient times peaked, like culture, art, uh, literature, science, math, medicine. Uh, so uh, the Guptas were, in, were ingenious with a lot of things. Like in medicine, uh, if you know about it, they were the first to develop vaccines like a long time ago. Uh, math, I think they, they developed the idea of the, the zero, something they kind of developed. Uh, I know, in, I know in, um, with astronomy, they were able to figure out uh, that the Earth uh, has 365 and one-fourth of a day. They developed like one of the first solar calendars that's actually accurate, uh, things like that. A lot of literature, a lot of art and sculpture, uh, also, of course, being developed uh, in ancient India. Uh, they did have different rulers that reigned over it. Here's another image, of course, of the Gupta Empire. But uh, the one they talk about that was the first one that founded it was a uh, ruler named Sir Gupta, uh, who was an Indian king that they think lived maybe close to about uh, the late third century. And so that's where the name comes from. In fact, the Gupta name is a very famous surname uh, in India, like modern India today. A lot of people have that name. Uh, so it's kind of sent it back to these people. Uh, and uh, one thing about the Gupta dynasty, uh, it was a Hindu dynasty. They helped to popularize it throughout India, but uh, they let other religions practice like Jainism and Buddhism as well. Uh, you can see those are some other famous rulers. Uh, they have also the ones that were big, they talk about usually are Chandra Gupta the first, uh, Samudra Gupta, and also Chandra Gupta the second. Those would be the probably the most famous ones uh, that are well known. I think out of the emperors, uh, the one that's the big one was Chandra Gupta the first, uh, who lived in the fourth century. Uh, he was known for reuniting the Indian subcontinent in like into an empire. And so he's one that really, really starts the actual empire itself because they think it started out as a kingdom back in the 200s CE. And then uh, Chandragupta I was the grandson of the original King Gupta. 
Uh, they're known for other things. Like one thing I did want to mention about, which is real famous. Uh, they're famous for starting one of the first universities, like in the world, uh, which was called Nalanda. You may have heard of it. Uh, Nalanda was believed to be some type of Buddhist monastic university, which was situated now today in what would be Bihar, India, which I think is in the eastern eastern part of India. And uh, they think it was developed in the 400s <clears throat> CE or 5th century CE. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it was kind of famous for developing a lot of not just cultural ideas uh, that were you know, based off Buddhism on uh, things like that, but a lot of uh, sacred uh, Sanskritic texts were written there uh, over time. <clears throat> in fact, I think they said at one point that uh, their libraries had over 9 million texts of uh, various philosophies uh, that probably not just Buddhism, but Hinduism and other things in culture, math, science, uh, any kind of ideas uh, that were circulate in India, it was kind of uh, there uh, at that university. Now, is it the first university in the world? Not, They're not sure about that. Uh, I think the theory I have uh, about universities, <clears throat> I guess if you had to have one that was like the first university, uh, it would really be uh, likely Plato's The Academy. Uh, which I think goes back to something like 4th century B.C., so a little, little further back uh, than that. Uh, but <clears throat> for, you can see it was around a long time, like seven, 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 eight centuries uh, that existed at one point. But uh, if you know what happened, it got sacked by uh, Muslim invaders uh, and they destroyed it. And a lot of the texts got burned, uh, if, you know, if you know about that issue. Uh, what happened to the Gupta Empire? Uh, well, if you know about the Gupta Empire, uh, they got sacked by these people called the Huns, which they're called either the Puna peoples or the White Huns. I think they're called different names. Uh, they usually nickname them. Uh, and uh, they sacked the state in the 6th century CE. So 500s uh, CE uh, was, was when that occurred. And so their empire collapsed and broke up. And so for a long time, uh, India doesn't really have any major empires. I think you've got a collection of kingdoms <clears throat> that are throughout, like India. I don't think you really get, I think the next <clears throat> major um, kingdoms that you, at least that the states that become empires is the Mughal Empire. Uh, you get that empire, which is a Muslim empire uh, that will develop close to like the 1500s uh, in India. And you also got the Maratha Empire that occurred. That one is another empire uh, that also developed right after that one. Uh, before the British come in, the British take over India, uh, like kind of like between the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, you get the British come in. And the British control India for like 300 years or more. Uh, So-called British Raj, uh, they're in power. Uh, and so India for a long time, like in modern times, uh, is controlled by foreign foreign powers. So, so anyway, that's that's kind of the, the, the history of you know the background of ancient India uh, with that 